Hello and welcome to this 11th session of Introduction to International Relations. For this presentation, we are going to be looking at regionalism, regionalism in global affairs and with an emphasis on the European Union, as it's the most institutionalized of the different regions of the world. Regionalism is, is often not thought of, of one of those particularly prominent or fashionable issue areas, the way one thinks of or one thinks of human rights or international security, political economy, environmental uh, issues, and so on and so forth. But it plays, plays an increasingly important role in, in different parts of the world. And there are different aspects that we need to understand. And, and because it, regionalism is understudied, in some ways that makes it even more important uh, that there's awareness that IR students have of this this issue that is something that's going to well already is important but it will become increasingly important over time and and again I I, I would make the uh, point to you uh, that uh, I'm going to be giving some historical and, and theoretical and conceptual frameworks to, to explain uh, regionalism but also to, to, to look at the case of the European Union why the European Union is warts and all, of course, why, in a set, why it's the most institutionalized of the different regions, uh, and obviously putting some focus there on the history of, of Europe and the post-Second World War context. So again, surprise, surprise, you have an image for the first uh, uh, slide. Um, and again, I don't need a major interpretation. It, see if you can guess what this particular image is. This is just an empirical, factual question. You can even pause the video if need be. For those of you who said that it's, or, or, or see that it's the European Parliament in Strasbourg, not a million miles away from Karlsruhe, you would be correct. Um, and again, this, I, I choose this image, so legislative branch of, of the European Union. Again, I, I, I should say that I'm focusing my remarks mainly on the European Union. Why? Because it's a good example of how regionalism has unfolded and worked uh, um, in a very developed way. But I will make comment on other regions uh, during um, certainly the early part of this presentation. Now, what is regionalism? Well, here's a couple of definitions. One obvious definition uh, that, 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 that the one can come up with is regionalism is an expression of a common identity and purpose combined with the creation and implementation of institutions that shape collective action within a geographical region. So let me, in a sense, uh, take, take those different aspects of, of this um, definition. Firstly, that there's, a, again, and this is where we can bring in constructivism from the outset, there's a notion of a common identity where different, in, in this case, state actors have over time become more and more socialized to, to fill a certain sense of common identity and, and a shared, let's say, belief systems, values to some extent, and, I, and I'll go into this and I'll also go into the limitations of this shortly, but whereby one can identify as being a European as well as a German or a Belgium or a Pole. Um, and in the case, uh, identify closely with, the, with being a member of the European Union um, or being uh, a citizen of the EU. Um, and again, there's always a relationship and sometimes the tension between, let's say, interests and identity. Is it identity, if you're one is a constructive, is it, is it identity that helps shape interests? Or if we are rationalist, i.e. realist or liberal institutionalist, we would, one would argue that it's the interests that have, have, let's say, helped expand the European Union over time. Or is it more the identity that has helped shape over time, so a constructivist approach? Um, but in both cases, uh, whether it's more, more an obvious interest materialistic uh, approach that realists and liberals would argue in different ways, or a more constructivist approach, it's over time where there is a sense that there is a unity within the European Union, whereby there's a shared belief system and a shared purpose of what one is and what one wants to do in the world. And here that takes us nicely to Andrew Hurrell's work, a major regionalist uh, scholar, also a major scholar looking at um, Brit the BRICS, um, an important scholar uh, of international relations, the English school, and I highly recommend his work to you. And here's a quotation from his work, the growth of social interaction within a region, the often undirected processes of social and economic interaction. Here again, he, he's, he is bringing in a constructivist element to his point, 
which is that there's often a social interaction within a region whereby different actors, state but also non-state actors, are socialising and being socialised. So, so aspects like a flag. So you go to a capital city and, and you see a national flag and an EU flag. This is a more subtle form of socialisation where one can feel both part of a nation state but also part of, of in this case, the European Union. Um, the often undirected processes of social and economic interaction. And there's one aspect here that, that's important. It's not that everything flows and, and regionalism has become more and more the case in, let's say, Africa or Latin America or East Asia or South Asia, whatever the case, or of course the Middle East. There's often, let's, and even Europe, of course, things move forward and they move backwards. Um, but there's one aspect that, that needs to be brought up here, and that's this notion that you've come across in this class, of interdependence, Joseph and I and other major thinkers. So it's the case that, let's say, the more countries become interdependent, the more likely that this can actually create more peaceful conditions. But one needs to almost go a step forward and bring in this constructivist element of how identity then starts to shape who one is and who wants one wants to be part of something bigger than itself. Um, and the point here is that um, this social interaction with the region and integration, interdependence, it doesn't necessarily mean um, interdependence here, that it leads to more regionalism or more integration. However, integration as a concept is something that as countries become more integrated, connected and so on and so forth, it creates the purpose of who, of who and what uh, a region is and how and in what ways the different entities and different actors, particularly state actors, but also non-state actors, um, are socialised and, and create this common identity and purpose, as in the first point in this slide. So, in, to cut a long story short, we have to look at how this self-awareness, how what it means to be, let's say, Latin American or European or African, whatever the case might be, how this may or may not develop into more of a regional identity and a common sense of purpose and objectives. And this takes us nicely onto regional cooperation and re regional integration. It manifold onto many different levels. So here, as you can see, whether it's economic, social, political, security, um, and in some cases, of course, let's say, even in the European Union, again, the most institutionalized of the different regions, uh, there's an argument, let's say, when we look at the euro, uh, the monetary uh, um, factor in the European Union and countries that have signed up uh, to, to having, in this case, the euro as, as their currency, here you can see it's not the case that necessarily it's created more political integration and one of the points about let's say all well, the criticisms of the euro is that that political integration hadn't gone far enough for it to work now again this opens up a whole uh, set of questions and it's politically contentious but the point is in each case the more there's let's say development in one area whether it's economic or social or security or political this covers sometimes just that particular area but it can also spill over into another area uh, and this is uh, so for both cooperation and how countries become closer together and again build up this identity and sense of common purpose to create more integration and here institutions so liberal institutionalism are important because it's institutions themselves are creating and pooling resources and sharing information and so on now again this is a a let's say a contentious point but but the point nonetheless that i want to make as you can see the third point of this slide there is some pooling of sovereignty um, and some giving up of sovereignty in some way so in the case of of let's say the post second world war context both france and germany the schumann plan which i will go into shortly there is an acknowledgement of let's say giving up some of its sovereignty to pull resources to get closer with another nation state. This, this, this particularly for Germany or Western Germany, um, was important in the post-1949 context. Why? Because Germany wanted to be reintegrated into the Western system. Um, subsequently, of course, 1949 was an original member also of NATO. And this is something that was important for not only, let's say, Germany's identity in the post-Second World War context, but its sense that it wanted to cooperate and become more integrated with France, 
and and the other four members of the original six, the founding six countries, i.e. the three Benelux countries, as well as Italy, France and Germany itself. So, yes, there is a pooling of, of sovereignty, um, but it's but it's open ended in how much and in what way, because in some cases, the argument against that is that actually states themselves in a globalized world, world actually are more powerful rather than less powerful because they are part of something bigger than themselves. Again, the, the case of the European Union, I, I will refer to time and again. OK, so these governance structures is not in regional governance and the development of regional governance, whether in, in part in, in Africa as a region or East Asia or Latin America. And again, there are different levels and the different levels of institutionalizing institutionalization and of course, North America, too. It's not necessarily going against globalization. In fact, sometimes it can be a response to globalization in, in the need. And this was something that the British Prime Minister, Tony Blair, often said about why the UK should be playing a central and leading role in the European Union, um, because it gave not only Britain, but also the European Union further clout, power, um, interest and common identity too, uh, in how the European Union would be shaped not only internally, but also how it would have more influence in the world at large. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a contradiction. In fact, globalization, whether economically, socially, politically, diplomatically, can actually play, play some historically, can actually be something that almost lessens sovereignty if, if you're a small state with, with not so much influence in particular parts of the world. So the point being that these governance structures some, sometimes are, or are not necessarily in contradiction to globalization, but, but are arguably a response to it and a way of regions shaping their identity and interests. And again, cooperation and integration are um, not the same thing. Cooperation, one can cooperate, work closely with each other, but it doesn't necessarily lead to more integration. But once there is more integration, this creates certain opportunities, or as I've put here, also limitations on what states can do within a region, but also what a region can do with other regions. Um, and again, as I've emphasized previously in this presentation, there are different levels of institutionalization in different regions of the world, different parts of the world. Um, and this is important because some regions have benefited arguably from this, from this highly institutionalized aspect that have taken place. Again, particularly the EU, but to a certain extent also ASEAN has, has, has a certain amount of regional integration. So this regional space has therefore, and this is regional integration we're focusing on on this particular slide, we're looking at common rules, norms. So a free trade area, a customs union, and a customs union whereby goods and services can be freely traded and so on and so forth, a common market. In the EU, again, to re reference the EU, the four freedoms. And the four freedoms that we have, um, and in, in this case, let's say, of the European Union, and as you are aware, the UK deciding not to be a member. So whether we, we let's say, um, think about the European Union as a positive, it allows peoples to, to people, European Union citizens to move into other places to, to in this case, for, for businesses and individuals to, to work and in other countries, also for trade, to, free trade to happen, um, and rules and norms that have been put together, whereby there is a level playing field for all of the, the now 27 members of the European Union, was 28 with the UK. Um, and beyond this certain level, it eventually becomes, and again, the EU is, is perhaps the only obvious example that one could come here, but where the EU st has started to have a single voice internationally. So often you will notice that G7 or G8 meetings, or sometimes a meeting whereby uh, uh, the, the European Union is represented. There might be, there is, in the case again of G7 or G8 or G20, there are, to give examples of, of let's say, the leading uh, world economies, there are the cases where you have the prime ministers or presidents or chancellors of, of the country representing the single nation state, and then there are um, the, let's, the head of the European Commission and he head of the European Council there representing, they, they, they are representative of the European Union and they are the voice of the European Union, uh, not uh, 
representing a single nation state like Germany or France or Italy or the UK. Historically, the UK, not in the, UK, in the EU anymore. Um, but the point being that this is a single voice that the EU has, and it plays an increasingly important role in the world at large. Such processes may lead to a new level of governance about the nation state. And again, it's contentious. And as you know from the chapter that you've read, there's, it's not right or wrong whether, let's say, sovereignty has, has radically decreased or it's increased. This is an open-ended question that we can discuss in class. Um, but the point is that in some cases there is a sharing of, of resource, pooling of resources, and this has created different levels of governance uh, within the case of different regions. Now, let's, let's look at a few examples. Uh, briefly, we have the example of the African Union. Um, now, the case of Africa, obviously a huge continent, um, hugely varied um, culturally, socially, politically rich uh, continent. And it's not just in the case of, of the African Union, the whole region. There are different, let's say, regions within the main region, which is the African Union, uh, representing the whole of the continent, whether it's, let's say, East Africa or West Africa, with, with the idea of a monetary union, or Southern Africa or Central Africa. Each of these different parts of the African Union, sorry, excuse me, each of these these different parts of, of Africa have wanted to have more integration in those particular areas. The African Union in its own way, and headquartered in, headquartered in Addis Ababa in Ethiopia, has had some steps forward, but arguably it's limited in terms of institutionalization. And yes, there are meetings, heads of states. Yes, there is this idea of a common purpose, but still not a huge amount of, of integration at this stage more in a sense on the different parts of, of Africa, as I've mentioned, whether in West Africa, East Africa, etc. Likewise with the Arab League, uh, arguably, and there was, was certain hopes also historically in the 19, late 1950s going into the 1960s, um, there was cases where even countries, the case of Syria and Egypt becoming one country, one, one re republic. The, uh, the Arab League and the, the Middle East more, more generally, of course, it also consists of other countries like Israel, Iran, Turkey um, too. But the Arab League consists of a whole host of MENA, Middle East and North African countries, um, and have had some voice, and, and it has varied over the last 50 years of, of what influence uh, the Arab world has wanted to have collectively. But arguably, again, it's limited in terms of what the Arab League does do, because there are also disagreements between the different actors within the Arab League. So occasionally there might be a statement made from a summit meeting of the Arab League uh, condemning, it could be Israel of course, or, or some in terms of the Israeli-Palestinian issue or some other issue, but that's rare. Um, and the an, another regional um, bloc is, is represented by ASEAN, Association of Southeast Asian Nations. So really, again, in the last 40, 50 years, um, this particular block, the, the ASEAN, um, it's, it's fluctuated, it's varied in terms of how much integration has taken place. But arguably, this is uh, the region where there has been, economically speaking, trade, just to, to some extent, some socialization too. This is a region uh, after, European, after the European Union that, that I would argue has, has and also socialization in terms of identity and what its interests are, arguably has gone further further forward than a number of other regions. And finally, Mercosur, so parts of Latin America. Um, again, um, one could look at the history of Latin America, the role of the United States also historically, Mercosur and the different regions, uh, this, sorry, different countries within Mercosur, um, making up, um, let's say, what is a key, a key and important area and also in the future, something that have some sort of integration, whether on an economic or um, diplomatic context. But again, I would argue here that Mercosur is still in terms of its own institutionalization process, um, is not as far along the line as obviously the EU, but, but even as, as is the case ASEAN is. And then of course, <coughs> we could look at North America, the case of NATO, um, of course, the Trump administration has has uh, renegotiated what NATO is, etc. Um, that has some sort of regionalism, but I would say again, very limited. 
um, East Asia too. And one thing you should bear in mind that when there's conflict or when there's, when, when there's let's say, not a, a common sense of identity or purpose shaping, shaping interest, that's also an issue. Another good example there is South Asia, the, the uh, tension in South Asia between India and Pakistan, and hence regionalism is certainly not an, taking place in that part of the world. So now I would like to focus my remarks for the rest of this presentation on the EU. And why, and again, as I've argued before, because it's clearly the most institutionalized uh, and the most developed, and it's developed really since, again, as, as you know, from the post-Second World War context. And just a brief social science IR point. Um, Within the social sciences, there's this rationalist approach, um, so rational choice approach, that, that uh, i.e. actors uh, have access to perfect or near-perfect information. They do a cost-benefit analysis. If there's more benefit, they do it. If there's more cost, they don't do it. Hierarchy of preferences. If you go for one you, you, and you don't get one, you go for two. If you go, don't get two, you go for three. The point there that is at some stage you won't go for something if you as a state or a non-state uh, don't feel that you're benefiting getting your interest. And then there's a more, cons and this is something that tends to inform structural realism and liberal institutionalism, this rationalist approach. And then you have this constructivist approach that I've spoken a fair amount about in this module, how identity helps shape interest and how we are socialized state and non-state actors. And sometimes there's a connection between the two, but the point of why I want to mention this is, why has the European Union, think about this as a question now, whether one's more rationalistic or more constructivist, why has it become more and more integrated and regionalism has become much more of a thing of the EU? Has it been because certain nation states have had particular uh, interest material interests to actually, whether economically, politically, maybe even um, militarily to get actually closer to others? Um, has it, let's say, benefited again an economy of a particular nation state? Um, does it mean, let's say, bringing in Central East European countries in that, that it benefits your economy, um, your exports, um, you can have cheaper uh, labor force, et cetera, et cetera? That would be a more rationalistic approach. A constructivist approach, no, it's more about identity. And so we've, whether it's the horrors of the Second World War and the Holocaust, of course, or whether it's, let's say, we as European, yes, we've fought for hundreds of years, but now we can do this better. There's something beyond uh, just the nation state. And yes, the nation state is important in its way, but actually we can do something that, that goes beyond the nation state and we can find some sort of common purpose and identity that shapes who we are uh, and actually shapes our own common values and belief systems and not just within the European Union and the single market and the customs union um, and how we are socialized to, to feel closer towards one another, to feel European, whether it's through cultural exchanges, educational exchanges, living in, uh, uh, marrying in, in other countries, whatever the case might be within the EU, but also that we can shape and, and have an influence on the world at large and, and, and spread our values and belief systems on, on some level. Uh, or at least our, our belief systems and values can be have an influence uh, on others in a more subtle way. But the point is, there's a tension and sometimes a difference between these two different approaches. Is it purely because of interest that the European Union has expanded or is it because identity has helped shape interests, which over time has meant that the EU has, has become more institutionalized and has developed in certain ways. And again, there's not a right or wrong answer. It's just something for you to think about and a potential um, question you may answer um, going into the future. Possibly we'll, we'll look at this uh, in the next module we come together for foreign policy analysis. Now, what is the European Union? Well, it's a mixture, it's a combination of, of, fact, of, of two key factors and it's unique within the international relations and the international system. Um, and so it has elements, and as I've put here, of both supranationalism and intergovernmentalism. So both in a sense here, as you can say, international organizations and supranational institutions. But intergovernmental in terms of there are states playing key roles in, in, in guiding, shaping, challenging, agreeing, disagreeing on, on the direction of the European Union. And then there are supranational institutions 
like the European Court of Justice, about SAPRA, which actually, once a ruling has happened in the case of the European Court of Justice in Luxembourg, once a ruling has taken place, all 27 member states need to imp implement it. And we will see how, therefore, there's, there's often uh, a relationship and sometimes a tension between the intergovernmentalism and supranationalism within the European Union. Um, but we have to think of how this is important in terms of how the EU works. And so the various treaties from the get-go, from the, from the post-Second World War context, again, the original six, Germany, France, Italy, and the Benelux countries, i.e. Belgium, the Netherlands and Luxembourg, they create the creation of treaties among sovereign states to, to agree and, and agreements that are binding moving for the, into the future. Um, and, it, and the public goods, sharing of resources, and actually creating some sort of binding agreements, some sort of uh, factor whereby there's a closeness. Um, and eventually, over time, this has meant that actually, between this intergovernmental process, it's meant that actually it functions in some ways like an international organization that is actually agreeing on certain key factors and can move forward together collectively. Um, now, here you have a map of the European Union um, and you see all the, the countries in dark blue current members, which are the 27. Um, in 2004, there was an expansion of, of 10 countries in Central East Europe. Um, you may also see in what I believe you can see is red, the, a former member as of the 1st of February or the 31st of December 2020, when the UK and Northern Ireland left the European Union. Um, and it's really the end of this year when it, when it actually, institutionally speaking, leaves the European Union. Because as, as you know, I'm, I'm sure the UK and the European Union have negotiated for since, well, since uh, really uh, the summer of 2016 onwards, but in, and, and this since 31st of, of January to, to, of this year, till the end of this year, there's still, we have this transitional period. Um, what does a relationship look like between the UK and the rest of the EU? With that stated, the, EU, the EU, again, as we can see, is made up of a range of different countries. Um, and, and, and geographically speaking, you can see in the case of, of, of the Balkans, which are not members of the European Union, and the case of Turkey, which I'll mention a bit later, which is also not a member of the European Union, you can see that many parts of Europe clearly now are front and uh, an important part of what makes up the European Union. Um, and there are countries, as you may see, that are not a member of the European Union, like Norway, like Switzerland, but they have connections with the European Union. So um, you free trade agreements. Uh, they, Norway, for example, has signed up um, for the four freedoms, the, the common market, I should say. So it has certain rights and obligations like an European Union member state, but it doesn't quite have a seat at the table of the European Union talks, uh, commissions, institutions, but nonetheless, it deems it important to have some close relationship with the EU um, to have its own sort of, to benefit itself. Um, so again, you can see uh, the 27 countries here uh, and the different parts of Europe, what makes up the European Union. Um, and how large is the European Union? Well, actually, okay, now actually, forgive me, it's now, been reduced by 600 when I put this uh, statistic up, but it's approximately between 450 plus million people, so a significant amount. And nominally speaking, and here I, I take it from um, 2014, uh, and, and but you can see that actually uh, the European Union is a significant economic actor, an economic actor that actually is not too dissimilar in terms of its its size to the U United States or even or sorry or also China. The European Union as a block, obviously you have major economies like Germany, um, but as a block, it's actually it's close to rivaling uh, the other two major economic superpowers, which are ma the United States and China. So a significant voice in the world, materially speaking. Okay, now what I'm going to do is give a brief, uh, or somewhat brief, I should say, historical overview of the European Union and how it developed and so on and so forth. So again, the original six, 
that I referred to, the Benelux countries and Italy, Germany and France um, when they joined. Denmark and Ireland, Republic of Ireland, I should say, um, in 1973 and the United Kingdom. And as you, as you know, the United Kingdom is the only country to have left the European Union, um, partially because of the Lisbon Treaty allowing that in a clause. Um, and also, of course, first and foremost, because of the referendum that took place um, in 2016, June 23rd, 2016. Um, and then you see countries that joined in the 1980s, Greece, 1986, Portugal, Spain. I won't go through all of them, but you can see there in 2004, there was a major, what was what is known as in the literature as a big bang, that Central and East European countries joining the European Union and expansion uh, eastwards. So beginnings of European integration. Again, the, post, the, cold, the, the horrors of the Second World War and then subsequently the Cold War. Um, there was a lot of, of, let's say, creation and reaction to what came later. So the US uh, heavily supported originally more uh, in integration and relations within Western Europe. This was also from the Truman administration onwards. There was also a tension with the Soviet Union in post-Second World War context, and Comic-Con, which was the USSR's response, founded for economic and integration amongst USSR and its satellite states in Central East Europe. So there was often a tension between the two major superpowers, the United States and Soviet Union, in the, let's say, the formation of the Cold War, 1946, 47, 48, the... the first part of the Cold War. Um, and so we have to remember there was a Cold War context to this. Nonetheless, and this is important, um, actually within Western Europe, and UK was always an awkward partner, there were uh, thoughts that actually, or, or amongst the British political elite about whether they should play a leading role, having been a victor in the Second World War, in the shaping of it, and you even have um, famous speech from Churchill and so on, flouting the United States of Europe, etc. But nonetheless, the UK was never really front and centre to European integration. And arguably, this is the point I want to make here, France and Germany were front and centre from the get-go. And sometimes there's been tensions between France and Germany, but this has been a relationship that has been there from the out onset, outset, excuse me, and continues to be a very important relationship for uh, furthering of European integration or the development of the EU. And originally the coal and steel producing regions of Alsace-Lorraine. Why? Because this was Alsace-Lorraine, which was a region that actually changed hands from France to Germany on three occasions, perhaps more, but I, I, I say three for now. So the 1870-1871 Franco-Prussian Wars, where, where it passed hands from France to Germany. Then in 1914, or post-First uh, World War, uh, where it goes back to, to uh, France and then back to Germany in the Second World War context and then really the post-Second World War context um, and this is the point I want to make so forgive me with my um, not wonderful knowledge of Alsace-Lorraine the point is that it's a region that was part of France and part of Germany and, and that now again part of France and there's a lot of cultural and, and linguistic um, factors of both Franco-German aspect to Alsace-Lorraine but the point is there are key mineral and resources in the post-Second World War context of Alsace-Lorraine, which then was again part of France. And it was a way of pooling resources between these two nation states and saying, OK, we want to, to go beyond, let's say, the aggressor, this realist aggressive state that both states, of course, but in the case of the, especially this post, the Second World War context, Germany, the aggressor, Nazi Germany, um, but we want to eliminate trade barriers. So here we get this notion of interdependence and liberal institutionalism plays a, arguably as a theoretical framework that we could think of here. That you eliminate trade barriers on these key um, resources, coal, steel, iron ore, and starting to pull resources um, where you become more intertwined, more interdependent. And so it becomes more expensive to go to war, but also in a sense that there's not one country dominating, controlling uh, the resources, but there's actually a sharing and a cooperation and some form slowly but surely of integration and so the European coal and steel community is is let's say the key key step forward for what then becomes the European um, community subsequently um, 
And the EU as a term, of course, has only existed since the Maastricht Treaty. So we're going to be using a couple of other terms and treaties that, that are important here. The European Coal and Steel Community, as I referred to in the last slide, is the first significant step and you have the original six. Then in six years later in 1957, um, and it's important, by the way, that I give you a bit of historical context, because I want to show you how different actors, particularly state actors, actually created closer relations and what type of theories are useful here. So both the European Atomic Energy Community, um, Euratom, and the European Economic Community, both of these were, so this is removing tariffs. So some sort of common market and customs union, a connection, some sort of again here pooling of resources but also um, a level playing field um, and a creation of customs union whereby goods and services can be moved in a free and fair way um, and again this is a way of, of, of promoting notions of interdependence and whereby the, as there is more interdependence countries are creating between themselves the conditions for more peaceful relations uh, again a notion that comes from from liberalism And by 1967, another key date, the European Economic Commission has taken over these two entities of ECSC and Euratom. So it's been going to a unified uh, point. Again, I, I, I don't want to take all the time in the world on this, but I do want to take a, a key, another pivotal date, which is a single European Act. So this is important, a removal of all non-tariff barriers to mobility of people, goods, services, and importantly, capital. So these are what are known as the four freedoms, um, the single market, uh, that, and interestingly enough, uh, for the UK, which is, as we know, has left and doesn't want to be a member of the single market or the customs union, it was Margaret Thatcher, a conservative prime minister, who played a leading role in the single European act, uh, act and actually that the factor of, of capital moving freely, capital services, people and goods, um, but this was a shared venture amongst a range of the European, West European uh, nation states to create more, again, an important step forward in integration and the, what is known in the sing, as a single market and the four freedoms of people, goods, services and capital. Now, the European Union becomes actually named uh, the European Union on January the 1st, 1993, in the aftermath of the Maastricht Treaty where the EEC, as it says there, becomes the EU. And there's further cooperation on issues like defence, justice and domestic policy. It's, it's debatable how much forward there is with defence and even justice, but nonetheless, there are, let's say, these different pillars that are coming into place. And again, and this is more contentious to say in monetarism, the monetary aspects or economics here, um, that actually in, by 2002, the euro is introduced in, in 12 member countries. And here we can see three countries, the UK, Denmark, and Sweden opt out. Um, but you can see further integration um, that's happening. Um, the Treaty of Nice is important because it helps uh, establish and reforms the institutional structure. And this is the big bang where you have a year, a year later, 10 previous former Soviet republics, not all of them, um, let's say in the case of Malta or Cyprus were not former Soviet republics, but nonetheless uh, all connected directly with this, we're thinking of Baltic countries here, but part of, let's say, the satellite states of, of the Soviet Union or part of the Warsaw Pact, these, these, these various central and East European countries like Poland, Czech Republic, um, the Baltic countries, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, joining the EU, a big expansion um, for the EU, uh, and a slightly different characteristic, different aspects, because Central and East Europe now is playing an increasingly uh, will will subsequent to from 2004 play an increasingly important role in what the EU is uh, and how, let's say, integration continues. But here we think of uh, that it's important to to refer to the Copenhagen criteria. So a market economy, uh, a democracy, uh, uh, various standards of, of human rights. Each of these countries had to sign up and actually uh, have a certain level, i.e. As, as, as with rule of law, um, market economy, and in, in whatever the case might be in terms of human rights, each of these 10 countries had to, had to have achieved a certain level to be allowed to join the European Union. Um, 
and this is what this was referring to new members must adopt and adjust to, to various bodies of EU law. So both broadening and deepening. And of course, there are different countries, major countries in Western Europe, whether it's Germany that wants uh, an expansion towards Central East Europe, they both identity, but also interest there. For France, originally they wanted more of an expansion, perhaps even to North Africa rather than Central East Europe. And for the UK, it was like anyone can join, including Turkey, why not? Because we don't want to go so deep, we want to go broader. For, for Germany, this was arguably a, a success for them as a, as, as a nation state, and they would have more influence in the EU moving forward. Um, the structure of the EU. Well, here you've got the executive branch, which is independent, currently led the present commission, as you know, is Ursula von der Leyen. Um, and again, separate entity, and it directs also legislation, or at least the formulation, the guidance of, of policy, etc. And the European Commission, with civil servants working for it, permanent civil servants, this is the main bureaucracy led by Ursula von der Leyen. You have the Council of Auditors that create the budget uh, and make sure that the budget is, is done, uh, is, is audited correctly, etc, etc. Um, then you have the European Central Bank based in Frankfurt, monetary policy. Um, and this is, a, this is a very central and key role that, that the European Central Bank has for, for economics, um, for the setting of, of interest rates, etc. And this is why, let's say, for want of a better term, weaker economies like Greece have arguably suffered when they themselves can't set their own interest rates because it's decided in Frankfurt. Again, amongst the different uh, uh, states, but you have various key economists who are deciding for all 19 uh, states, those that are signed up to the euro. This is the executive branch, these different entities I've just referred to, and they play a, a key role and a leading role in, in what makes up the EU as an actual actor. Um, and, and, and yes, by the way, they do have to take into consideration nation states, they do have to consider, take into consider within the EU um, and its role, but arguably they also have their own, let's say, agency to take, um, whether it's a case of monetary policy, whether it's the case of of policy, they also have some agency, some independence from the nation states, as well as having a relationship with the various EU member states. Then you have the legislative branch, which is the European Parliament, popularly elected, um, and the European Parliament has a range from the far right to the far left and everything in between, um, and there are different blocks within it representing a particular, let's say, ideology. Um, the European pa Parliament plays a role in legislation. Um, and then you, the other key branch of the legislative branch is the Council of Ministers. And this is where national governments, whether France, Poland, Belgium, um, Latvia, Lithuania, whatever the case might be, various ministers, depending on what issue area we're talking about, representing their national government, um, and also feeding into legislation or in terms of whether legislation is voted for or, or not, whether something gets through. And it needs to get through, like in any parliamentary system, it needs to get through both of these legislative branches, both the European Parliament and Council of Ministers, for something to go into law. But again, something I want to stress is that the executive branch is front and centre to proposing uh, policy and legislation. And this is what gives, in this particular system, the, uh, the executive branch a clear advantage. And finally, of, of these... Uh, let's say the, the executive, legislative, and judiciary, and um, we look at the European Court of Justice um, and how it reviews national law. So, if a particular country, whether it's Poland, whether it's Hungary, whether it's France, whether it's Spain, is contravening European law, the Euro European Court of Justice can um, can st strike a ruling against a particular nation state. In this case, against the government, uh, and the government in question ought to imply. Uh, uh, Apply, so excuse me, the government in question ought to implement what it's supposed to implement. Um, and this is where the, the, we get into supranationalism in the European Court of Justice's uh, rulings are binding on all 27 member states. And implementing integration, well, it's these EU directives are, as I've referred to before, they are proposed by the European Commission. And really, it's more reactionary factor for leg this legislative branch, the Council of Ministers and the European Parliament, because they are not instigating legislation. They are just agreeing or, or disagreeing with it. And if they vote on it and it goes through both, both 
the Council of Ministers and the European Parliament, then it becomes legally binding. Um, and national governments then pass their own laws to implement this particular directive that has been proposed in the first place by the Commission. And different countries, whether Hungary, whether France, whether Portugal, uh, implement it in their own, let's say, way. But, it, but, but once the ruling is in place, it, it must be, according to European Union law, must be implemented <coughs> in each of the member states of the EU. And that's why it's directly binding. Um, and this comes from the, the, uh, the basic regulation coming from the Council of Ministers and the Ministers for particular departments who agree on something, um, whether it's finance, whether it's environment, uh, whether it's some other issue area. But again, the executive regulations are coming from the Commission and the Commission arguably is important here. Again, front and centre arguably. And the ECJ, the European Court of Justice, it hears complaints of the Commission or member states if a member is not implementing EU law. So there's, an, and, but this is an open-ended question of what sort of uh, punishment is given to an individual member state uh, and how, how powerful or powerless the ECJ is even in this context. Now, let's look at some areas where the EU is more integrated. Trade policy is referred to the uh, European Single Act um, and the Four Freedoms, the single market, i.e. the Four Freedoms. Um, so no tariffs with the EU, the customs union, um, common tariffs with other trading partners. And there's a collective negotiation and a powerful voice because as you know, the EU alongside the US and China are very large GDP um, and therefore has a larger voice in the World Trade Organization alongside the US and China. Um, limitations on, on monopolies, whether it's let's say uh, a major US company like Microsoft if a country is sorry, if a company is becoming too monopolistic, the European uh, Commission can actually play a role and take a, a company to court, so it can help limit uh, monopolies. Um, and this is an important uh, role that the EU has 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 done in in more recent times. And as I referred to before, monetary policy. So the euro, 19 member states have signed up to the euro, based in in Frankfurt, a single interest rate. So for both interest rates, inflation and currency, because they are interconnected economically speaking, the, the European Union has more integration in this area. Of course, there are some EU member states that are not part of the euro, um, but within the euro, this is, this is clearly much uh, real evidence of integration um, in terms of monetary policy. Um, and then this therefore requires certain constraints on taxation, spending and deficits deficits. Of course, each country has some leeway, uh, but there's some sort of shaping that comes from the fact that it's part of this, this, the same monetary union. And consumer health and safety regulations, again, with the UK and its, its negotiations with the European Union, this harmonised rules, this is a key sticking point potentially between, or is, between the UK and the EU of, of, of level playing fields or not. The, the UK is very sceptical of this. Um, but harmonising rules, so you increase economies of scale, again give a competitive advantage for the EU vis-a-vis -vis others. And another very important uh, issue area is free movement of, of people, the four freedoms, single market. Um, the ease at which one being member of 27 countries can travel and work in other countries um, within the EU. Um, police cooperation and tracking across borders. Um, so the security questions here as well. Um, but again, the UK Republic of Ireland, um, well, the UK now of course is, is now not a member of the European Union. Um, but the, there are questions of, of, in some cases, some countries and the UK always in this case was a little bit more awkward in that yes, it was very much a member of the European Union, but did not sign up fully for, for a range of different issue areas, um, including, um, uh, the Schengen zone, um, allowing people freedom of movement. Um, so the, the UK was always in this sense for better or worse an awkward partner. Um, but nonetheless, there is and there has been a free movement of people amongst what was 28 and now 27 member states, that one can go and live, uh, work, fall in love even, get married uh, and live in the country of question. And it's fairly straightforward because of the European Single Act. 
Um, now let's look at a, a least integrated issue area, foreign and security policy. Well, you've got the countries there that I've put uh, that are neutral. Uh, and for, of course, the European Union um, and its relationship with the US and Canada, Turkey too, it must compete with NATO for relevance. And arguably NATO has since 1949 onwards for Western Europe during the Cold War and post-Cold War Central East European countries. NATO has been front and center to security issues, but increasingly, and you can hear this whether from Merkel, uh, Chancellor Merkel or President Macron, increasingly the European Union act as a, uh, member states are starting to think actually, can we be reliant on the United States? Can we be reliant on, on our traditional ally, allies like the US as I referred to, or the UK? And so maybe there will be more increasingly of a um, foreign and security policy. Um, but again, the security, it's, it's less developed. Um, and there's a focusing on, on soft power and humanitarian inter intervention being important, not so much hard power. And as we famously may recall, 2003 invasion of Iraq, France in particular, but also Germany um, and other member states were not, a range of member states were against the invasion of Iraq. On the other hand, of course, the UK uh, and the governments of Italy, Denmark, Spain, not necessarily the people, but, but the governments were supportive. So there was a real division uh, uh, between these different countries. Um, and um, this was an, uh, an area of, of security where there was not so much integration or unity between the various European Union member states. The European Union constitution, which was never ratified and never, because it was rejected both in France and the Netherlands, as you can see, was something that was negotiated between the member states to simplify institutional structures, to get one document, one factor, where, where there's further simplification of the institutions, what their purpose is, et cetera, et cetera. But it was key to the notion of creating a president of the European Commission and a foreign minister of the European Union. And the next slide, I'm going to, we're going to be looking at the Lisbon Treaty. And the Treaty of Lisbon, whilst it was rejected by the Netherlands, the, the European um, Constitution was rejected by the Netherlands and France. Nonetheless, many of the same features come a number of years later, entered into force on December 1st, 2009, and it created two new functions in the EU institutional architecture. As you can see, you've got um, the President of the European Council, i.e. Charles, the, currently Charles Michel, um, the, the previous Prime Minister of Belgium, and the High Representative for Foreign Affairs and Security Policy, currently Joseph Borrell, um, previous Spanish Foreign Minister, I believe. And each of these uh, posts were, again, to the institutionalization process to say that we, the European Union, we are uh, more of a, now increasingly a single actor with a single voice, whether let's say amongst ministers and, and the governments themselves within the EU, but also in terms of foreign affairs and security. Um, and the treaty also made the Union's Bill of Rights, a Charter of Fundamental Rights, legally binding. So a further integration and a further, let's say, binding together of the different member states. Um, and, and this is where we get to Brexit shortly, but it also gave member states the right to leave the European Union and a procedure of how to do so, um, which famously the UK uh, ended up um, using um, in order to eventually leave the European Union after the vote of January the 23rd, 2016. But again, the Treaty of, of Lisbon is important because it's further steps forward for uh, European Union's integration and further institutionalization. And uh, Brexit, as you can see, uh, a very, very politically dramatic issue. I, I, I won't go into great detail on it. I also have a personal view on it um, that I'm happy to talk about and happy to talk about in class. But nonetheless, um, a long and short of it is, uh, and I could happily tell you a bit about the history of the UK, Euroscepticism um, and the narrowness of the, of the victory and, and why it took place and what took place subsequently. But to cut a long story short, um, the people, the British people from 51.9% um, voted to leave the European Union. Um, so a 2%, uh, let's say above, or 4% margin, but a 2% above 50%. Um, and the fact that the British electorate narrowly voted to leave um, the EU um, was clearly an important day in British political history, but also uh, eventually, and there was a lot of, of 
um, politics that took place in the next um, three years, three and a half years. But eventually it led to the UK triggering the Article 50. This was in, in, during Theresa May's uh, time as Prime Minister in 2017. Um, and the Parliament at the time agreed to it, voted as a majority, but there was a lot of, let's say, contention about what sort of deal, what it would look like when the UK leaves the EU. Should there be a second referendum if the deal is not a good one for the UK? All of this debate, really that this debate was put to bed and Parliament was, was challenging the government and subsequently when Boris Johnson became Prime Minister, um, in 2019, um, uh, this was was still a contentious issue, and eventually, famously, Boris Johnson called an election, uh, and and the Conservatives won by a clear majority of 80 in, in December 2019. So really, it was only a matter of time then that the UK would subsequently leave the the European Union, and this took place officially on January the 31st, 2020. Again, as I mentioned before, the UK uh, still until the end of 2020 is institutionally speaking a part of the European Union um, because it's in the transitional period and negotiating what this future relationship looks like. The point I want to emphasize here is though that yes as the European Union has become more integrated institutionalized there is let's say skepticism and it's not just in the UK but the UK is perhaps the most famous example and again this could be a socialization there could be constructivist aspect to it that the UK has always let's say not felt European I often cite this example but the UK famously um, didn't have um, a EU flag uh, in Westminster, it was almost impossible to see it, um, whereas often you, you could easily see a national flag, whereas in other capitals, you can see both a national flag and an EU flag. The, with, the UK was arguably socialised in a particular way, and arguably also its own interest saw itself as uh, having, could do, at least among some of the Brexiteers, could do better out economically, politically, diplomatically outside of the EU. Now, there are obviously arguments for and against this, but the point is that within the UK and other countries, there is there is other there is skepticism. So it's not axiomatic. This is a point I want to make. It's not axiomatic the European Union becomes more integrated, more institutionalized. Um, of course, in some cases, um, it can go forward and it can go backwards. But I, I should still though caveat all of that by saying that the EU has incrementally over time become more integrated and more institutionalized. So it may well be the case that the Brexit is actually the exception to the rule and that actually more countries uh, may, may even join the European Union and the European Union may even become more integrated. Um, so, and this takes us to this next point of further enlargement. So yes, Croatia has, is the most recent country to join. Um, and it, there are various Balkan countries, uh, as you may remember from the map I showed previously, that are official candidates. They would have to, um, in a sense, achieve the Copenhagen criteria and be accepted into the European Union. But nonetheless, there are official candidates. Turkey is the case, um, a difficult case, because it's wanted previously to very much to join the European Union and has, has again, has been seeking officially membership since 1987, although arguably since Erdogan has been in power in Turkey, institutionally speaking, and also the Turkish political elites have been more skeptical about this, this aspect of joining the European Union. Um, and again, here have, are some issues of why Turkey has struggled in terms of, uh, of, of getting further in its, its application to joining the European Union, which is a dispute with Greece over Cyprus um, from this Cypriot War of, of 1973-1974. Again, when we're looking at again, the Copenhagen criteria, concerns over democracy and human rights, and arguably here with Erdogan, it's gone backwards rather than forwards, discussing that's a point we can discuss in class um but the point is uh whether it's the case of of journalism and political and civil liberties the the kurdish issue um there are issues of of what let's say turkey would have to improve upon if it were the case that they wanted to join the european union and as i said before in more recent times that looks much less likely also from ankara from the turkish political elite's own perspective um and forgive me, I should have changed this particular uh, point on the slide, um, but Turkey has, again, officially negotiated to join the EU. So there's been, been, let's say, there has been a start, but again, this start is is only a start, and, and arguably, um, right now, Turkey is 
very far away from joining the European Union. Um, excuse me a second, that I just want to also uh, now take us into the three, uh, three IR theories of what relates to the EU. So again, I want to bring in international relations theory and show you how each of these theor theories, i.e. realism, liberal institutionalism and constructivism would explain the EU and its evolution. So after the Second World War, um, relative gains, it freed the European states, but West European states from relative gains. Um, and it was a way of, of projecting power, but also balancing its power against Eastern Europe and future, of course, Soviet encroachment, the Warsaw Pact. It was a, arguably, from a realist point of view, a reaction to the threat of uh, the Soviet Union and its satellite state and the Warsaw Pact. Um, now, famously, major structural realists like John Mearsheimer as an example in 1994-95 in international security and other realists have predicted that the EU will come to an end. Why? Because not only let's say the EU, the US itself may not ga guarantee uh, uh, the EU and its security anymore, but also um, because there's no purpose for it. Why? Because the Soviet Union collapsed and therefore the EU must come to an end. Well, we can see how this was not the case. And so we can also see some limitations of, of structural realists that actually there's a socialization process, an institutionalization process that we'll look at when we get to liberal institutionalism and constructivism. There was also the argument made by neo-realists that European states will actually try to balance uh, um, against US unipolarity. So the, the end of the Cold War, the US, the world superpower, the European Union would balance against the superpower. Again, this is where constructivism and other approaches, so identity or liberal uh, institutionalism shows that actually these, uh, the European Union states, yes, it's not the case that Western Europe, uh, after, the sec after the Cold War, excuse me, necessarily agreed with everything that the US was doing, but there's a lot of evidence to suggest it didn't balance against uh, the US, United States and still allied itself with the US. Um, so certain predictions of the EU and what would take place that have thus far proven unfounded. Neoliberalism on the EU, well, again, this integration that we, we when we look at the Schuman plan all the way to the present, that it was a way a win-win situation, liberal institutionalism, that over time it would create wealth, not only between the states, but also the peoples. And again, interdependence, it would make it too costly to go to war. Uh, and over time, creation of a win-win situation between different member states, uh, non-state actors too, and a division of, of specialization uh, of, or division of labor, um, and free trade would allow specialization. So a country that, let's say, producing wine, another country producing cars, whatever the case might be, and this would, over time, according to the Ricardo, um, liberal economic thought, would actually create a more prosperous regional bloc. Of course, this is not always the case. And of course, some countries have benefited more than others. Some parts of countries and some um, other entities have benefited more than others. But nonetheless, over time, European integration, the intention was to improve, let's say, uh, political and legal institutions, but also create more wealth, uh, improve education, um, et cetera, et cetera. And this interdependence um, between different uh, states uh, created um, more prosperity, according to liberal institutionalist uh, thought. Um, but again, and this, this, there are issues here, uh, and it can go forward, but it can also go backwards, as we know, and it can also lead to some, some areas and some parts of the European Union being less well off, and this causes resentment too. Um, but nonetheless, this is this efficiency, this creation of more integration actually is intended to spread also, um, whether it's economic wealth, but also to spread uh, the different ideals and different uh, aspects of what the EU is made up of. And side payments or issue linkage. So this really looks at spillover and, and the notion of how one issue area can spill over into another issue area uh, and benefit um, in, in different ways. And again, I should re-emphasize this point, more integration, more interdependence between different countries, making it less likely they'll go to war, less likely the EU itself and the institutions will break up. 
And finally, looking at constructivism on the EU, we can look at, um, yes, it might be the case that there were certain interests, self-interest, material interests, but actually, is that the full story? No, it isn't. And we can see, and there's just a, a few points here, so it's a brief point, but actually, a common identity is created over time. A, a flag that's created in 1955 that, that we can see in different capital cities and so on, that makes up not only the am I, I'm, I'm now giving an example, not only am I, let's say, German or Greek or Latvian, but I'm also uh, European. And this is something and, and important to who I am, what I want, uh, what I want to be a part of, why I would, would help others. Um, and why, let's say, we self and other, we European and others coming from other parts of the world are the other, for better or worse. Um, uh, and why it also means that uh, people feel a common sense of purpose and feeling of solidarity within, let's say, the case of the 27 member states. So Beethoven's Ode to Joy, famous uh, um, piece of music, an anthem, it is the official anthem of the European Union. Um, and or one thing that, so there are cultural and identity factors playing an important role um, of what it means to be European. And there are parallel developments of nationalism. So one thing I want to emphasize here is it's not by having being more part of the European Union one necessarily loses one's nationality and there can be a tension or there can be a, sometimes a, a not even a tension, a relationship between the two of course, um, i.e. one can be an Italian as well as a European, um, but we have to look at uh, this relationship in in terms of, of the effect for in terms of development or challenge to the EU. And again, this is where constructivism becomes important and why, let's say, the European Union evolves, has evolved the way it has. Again, here, here we look at there are certain shared history and identity of what, it, what one perceives as also a shared identity, belief systems, norms. And again, this is where post-structuralism, so under the big umbrella of constructivism, um, Turkey and a Muslim state, i.e. the other, self and other, if we remember, post-structuralism, this binary distinction. So can Turkey be predominantly a Muslim state? Can it join the European Union? Well, of course it can, but arguably in some ways from a constructivist or even here post-structuralist point of view, it may never join, may never join because it's perceived and, and represented as the other. Um, and integration continues through development of European identity and elites tend to, uh, are ones that in, in many ways uh, promote um, this, this uh, uh, integration, um, the creation of it that actually that, that we are, are representing not only just our nation state but something beyond that. So again, this relationship between supranationalism and intergovernmentalism um, that we create something that benefits all European citizens. So in class we'll, we'll be looking at this question alongside again some of the other questions that I've got for regionalism and the question is the following, has the European Union been able to respond effectively to the changed circumstances of global politics. And again, for this presentation, thank you very, very much for your attention. Again, regionalism, an issue area that, that is understudied, um, not seen necessarily as significant as something like international security or human rights or um, international ethics, um, but nonetheless, a very, very important issue area, something that's important to the world, um, both past, present, but also the future. And arguably regionalism arguably may even play an increasingly important role in this world of ours in international relations. Um, so again, thank you for your attention and see you in class. Take care. Goodbye.